Our God is a prayer answering God. Psalm 65 verse 2 confirms that to us. Praise with it for thee, O Lord, in Zion. Unto you that heareth prayers shall all flesh come. God does not store prayers. He answers prayers. So if you have prayed, the next thing to do is to expect the answers. So may I accept, expect my answers. Let me hear you say that again. God does not store prayers. He answers prayer. So every prayer you have prayed, the last 37 days, God has already answered. Amen. If you believe that, wave your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The theme of this season, as I'm told, is grace beyond disgrace. And it will answer in your life. Amen. From this season, you shall not see disgrace again. Amen. Let me read to you this prophetic word as the Holy Spirit is inspiring me right now before I do some teaching and then we pray and be on our way home. Zephaniah chapter 3. I take it from verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Amen. What kind of God is in your midst? Mighty. Say it again. Mighty. You don't have a weakling God. You have a mighty God. You see, sometimes we need to reassure ourselves of what we possess. Some people ask me, why do you pray so relaxed? Because I'm talking to a mighty God. Amen? You know, if you know who you serve, you don't sweat, you don't struggle, you don't shake. My prayer is usually very simple and straightforward. Because the person on the other side answers me mightily. You will not struggle again. May I ask you again, what kind of God do we have in our midst tonight? Say it again. See, sometimes God wants us to tell him who he is. In the human setting, if you call a name, the person answers. God awaits us to call his name before he answers. When Elijah said, let the one who answers by fire come down. How did God answer? By fire. He answers the way we address him. What kind of God do we have with us here tonight? And what will he do? He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. That means he will settle with you. That's why I don't see Satan around me. A lot of people see the devil around themselves. But I, I, I see God everywhere I turn. I see God. From today you will see God everywhere you turn. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, look at what he will do. Furthermore, verse 18, and I'd like you to take that as a word for you after this season of prayer and fasting. I will gather them that are sorrowful for a solemn assembly who are of thee and who the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee. Somebody say a faith-filled amen. Amen. And I will rescue her that halted, that is the one who is stagnated, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame. What will he get for you? Praise. Say it again. In every land where they have been put to shame, I declare to you tonight that your shame shall be turned to fame. Your shame shall be turned to praise. Amen. And at that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I'll gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the heart when I turn back your captivity before your eyes. 
before your eyes that means in a twinkling of an eye do you know that that will happen to someone here tonight something instantaneous will turn around in your favor tonight if you receive that word of prophecy raise your hand and thank God for it and begin to declare my shame shall be turned into fame into a name my reproach shall be turned from tonight thank you mighty father in Jesus precious name amen please get seated now as we all know life is a race You are either running or you are run down. Stagnation is not permitted in the journey of life. You are either moving or you are removed. When you stop going up, you start coming down. There is no plateau in life. Life is a race. And the only way to win is by grace. I've met many mighty people, mighty in finance, who have been brought to zero. Mighty in position, who are now described as X. X this, X that. Anything that does not come from God is never permanent. And that's why in the human system, they say no condition is permanent. There are three major things that people rely on in this race of life. They rely in strength. But the scripture says, by strength shall no man prevail. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 9. By strength shall no man prevail. The first king in Israel, Saul, had Jonathan his son, and one or two other sons as team players in war front. David knew them, so he gave a very detailed description of them. The three of them died in one day. Their strength failed them. And David said, how are the mighty fallen? Second Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 and 27. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war lost? So, might is not reliable. Strength is not dependable. Don't trust your strength. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. Psalm 20, verse 8. David said, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Don't rely on strength. <laughs> Isaiah the prophet gave a detailed description of how strength fails. Isaiah chapter 40, from verse 28 to 31. He says, the young men shall fail. They shall fall utterly. Strength is not to be relied upon in the race of life. Because... In this life, there is nothing that will not fail, nor faint, nor fade, or sway with time. Everything man can rely upon fails, wins, faint, or fail with time. Another thing people rely upon is their intellectualism. And we have plenty of that everywhere. There's a man called Ahitophel who even committed suicide because his cancer, his intellectual was messed up. High profile people, first class graduates, specialized trainings, professors, yet poor, empty, afflicted, which haunted. Job seeking because they rely on their intellectualism. You know, there is no crime in having good intellect. 
But without the help of God, it will not take you far. Tonight we are examining something that is beyond intellectualism. Now we are aware from scriptures of the wisdom of Solomon. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us he excelled in wisdom. But Solomon departed from the Lord. Now, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says, And Solomon loved the Lord. That is where the beginning of his wisdom uh, is noted. And down to verse 8, that chapter, the Lord appeared to him and gave him wisdom. And in chapter 4, from verse 29 down to 31, or 34 rather, from verse 29 to 34, the description of his wisdom is that his wisdom and understanding was like the sand of the seashore. And his wisdom excelled the wisdom of the wise men everywhere. And all men sought the wisdom of Solomon. Now, Solomon didn't travel anywhere, yet his name was everywhere. If you are familiar with Bible studies, there was no record that Solomon traveled to the next nation. There was no need for that. All nations came to him. And when they came to him, they came with their resources. He was a consultant by excellence. But in the process of time, Solomon deviated from the wisdom of God. Now, if you are familiar with study of scripture also, you discover that there is a great line between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs was pure wisdom. Ecclesiastes is purely human wisdom. Divine wisdom is what Proverbs represented. If you read Proverbs, you see accuracy, you see neatness, you see decency. But come to Ecclesiastes, vanity upon vanity. Everything is vanity. He apparently wrote Ecclesiastes in the state of drunkenness. At the time, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11, hear what Solomon said. He said, then I returned. He returned from human wisdom, from intellectualism. You see, intellectualism does not equal wisdom. No. Wisdom is a gift from God. Intellectualism is acquisition of knowledge. You can acquire knowledge and not know how to apply it. Otherwise, how can a professor be lying down in a car with a girl that is younger than his daughter? Is that wisdom? He said, then I returned. I returned because I discovered that the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. Riches is not to them who are wise, in quote, who have intellectualism. Then I return. So, intellectualism cannot take the place of success in life. Number three thing that competes in the race of life is money. People rely on strength. They rely on powers, political power, and all kinds of power. They rely on intellectualism. They rely on money. But money fails. And like you are all aware, money is failing today. Am I right? Money is failing. A time is coming, please watch out, when people will have money and not have what to buy. Watch it. Who will ever believe that a dollar will be selling for what he's selling today in Nigeria? Money is failing. So don't rely on money. I beg you, don't rely on your bank account. God never promised to bless you according to your bank account. He said, my God shall supply all my need according to what? His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, you can't rely on anything that is in your pocket these days. 
I don't let my pocket speak to me. I don't let my bank account speak to me. I let this book speak to me. This book is my source. Genesis 47, 15, money failed. And watch it, money will soon fail again. Money, fail it. So as it were, there is nothing in life that is sufficient. So don't make a boast on anything that you have. I beg you, don't make a boast of anything you have because anything physical, natural, will fail or wane or sway. The only thing that's sufficient in life is what the scripture calls grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had some conflict from verse 7. God gave him abundance of revelation. And there with it came a thorn in his flesh. And Paul, a prayer warrior, prayed according to him three times I besought of the Lord. He, he prayed. Do you know that even prayer can fail? Oh, yes. This may not sound theological. That is, even when you pray, don't rely on your prayer. Because it's one thing for you to pray. It's another thing for God to answer. <laughs> That's why when you are praying, don't calculate the grammar you put inside the scriptural permutation. How you join scriptures to scriptures and everybody is nodding their head, commending you. <laughs> Paul prayed three times. He said, three times I prayed that this thing may be gone from me. And God said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. That is the only thing the Bible ever mentioned that is sufficient. So, grace breaks all limits. Grace terminates all disgrace. When grace appears, disgrace disappears. This is why the number one thing I seek in my life is the grace of God. I've told people over and over again everywhere I've been, never call me a strong man. I'm not one. I'm simply an engraced man. You know why? There is no amount of strength that is not measurable. But grace is immeasurable. There is no amount of money that is not measurable. You write a check at the back or at the end of the figure. What do you put? Only. Put the whole lot of the money on hers together. At the back of it, or at the end of it, you must put only. Otherwise, it will not be recognized. That shows the limitedness of money. There is no qualification that is not describable. Even if you have 13 degrees, the description will end. But there is one thing that is sufficient. The grace of God. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. You know what grace does? It covers your errors and colors your efforts. That's why people meet me and they think I am faultless. They think I'm flawless. What you have just seen is the grace of God at work. For you to think that this man standing before you has no fault, it must be something else that you saw, not him. When you are enveloped in grace, it is like a letter in an envelope 
nobody sees the letter but the beauty of the envelope. That's what grace does. Men of grace are usually faultless, flawless. People don't see their errors. They only see the color of the grace around their lives. That's why you must rely on grace. You go looking for a job, go with grace. That is what will make them not to see the details of your certificate. Or not to even bother to look at it. That was what worked for David. David, from record, there was no indication that he went to school. He was a little shepherd boy, abandoned in the bush to take care of his father's sheep. At the point of selection of the next king to Saul, nobody thought they should consider him. He was not enlisted. The prophet got to Samuel's house, I mean to Jesse's house, and asked him, where are your sons? He brought eight of them out. The first one, Eliab. At the sight of that young man, Prophet Samuel said, there's no need praying again. This is the one we're looking for. Because his chest was king size. His movement was majestic. His grammar was eloquent. And the prophet took the oil to anoint him. And the Lord said, hey, stop there. You judge by sight. There is something I'm looking for. And in amazement, all the eight passed by. None was deemed qualified. And out of frustration, the prophet asked, do you mean you don't have another one? No, no. Jesse said, well, 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 I'm not sure that you will uh, like the one I have remaining. They may not like you. They may not choose you. They may not appoint you. But grace will bring you out. And they said, well, let's go and bring that boy. He said, we will not sit until he comes. And so they went to bring the boy. Looking ruddy. The wind was blowing him because he had no stability. He had no weight. You know, in, in life, there are people that when you see them physically, they look like what you are looking for. And there are some who don't look like it, like myself. <laughs> you know, if people are not surprised at what is happening through your life, then grace is not at work. The evidence that grace is at work in your life is that you don't look like the result you are having. And I can tell you that's my story. I don't look like it. And I'm not planning to look like it. Engraced people don't seek to impress others. Yet they impress results in the mind of those who watch them. As a young pastor, a couple visited me. I had the privilege to pray for the woman and uh, she got a touch from the Lord and insisted that the husband should follow her to see me. And they got into a you know, living room, so I was called from in there to come to see them. So I came down and I sat with them. We were chatting. And the man whispered to the wife, where is the man we are waiting for? <laughs> because I didn't look like it. Where is the man we are waiting for? So David appeared, and while Samuel, who had been carried away from the realm of the prophetic, was assessing the little boy, God said, stand up, anoint him, this is he. That means even in his mind, Samuel had questions. He was doubting, can this fellow make it? Grace is for those who cannot make it. When you can't make it, that's when you need grace. When you don't look like it, that's when you need grace. Grace is not for those who can do it. It's never for those who have the ability. As a matter of fact, 
until you come to your end, grace does not start. So the earlier you come to the end, the earlier grace starts working. You know the reason why the grace of God has not worked in the life of many people? They are full of strength. They are full of their ability. They are very efficient and sufficient. They are very able of their own. I have seen many preachers, for instance, who have the message but lack the audience. It's too powerful to have an audience. Yet you meet somebody else who doesn't know how to speak well. Yet the multitudes are there listening to him. Grace at work. Now I command your access into that realm from now. As I'm speaking to you now, that grace is endowed upon you. Now, you know, Paul the Apostle said, addressing some people, he said, ye are partakers of my grace. Please get seated. Ye are partakers of my grace. When a man under the grace of God is speaking, is simply releasing the grace he carries upon his life. When I teach on healing, for instance, people receive healing. When I teach on prosperity, people receive prosperity. Now I'm teaching on grace. How many of you will release it? Release it, receive it. Receive it in the name of Jesus. You know, Peter said, what I have, I give unto you. A man cannot give to you what he does not have. There are those who teach it and there are those who impart it. I'm not here tonight just to teach. I'm here to impart upon you. I'm not here to enlighten you. I'm here to empower you. Now receive it. Quickly, what is grace? From all we've said, just two definitions. Number one, grace is divine enabling. Divine enabling. There is human enabling. There is financial enabling. There is intellectual enabling. There is physical enabling. There are natural endowments. There are natural endowments. You see people who are gifted, endowed, but nothing compares with divine enabling. Why do we call it divine enabling? Because it connects you to divine life. Why do we call it divine enabling? Because it is out of this world. That's why when you find a man of grace, don't compete with him. Otherwise, you are wasting your time. Because he is operating and purchasing from the realm outside of this world. You know something unique about grace? When it is in operation, you don't sweat. For instance, I don't sweat. I don't struggle. Yet people cannot deny the effect of what, by his grace, he does through my life. I sleep like other church members sleep. If I'm awake, I'm awake only to refresh myself in study and in prayer. Not that I'm cracking my head. How would this thing work? That's why I look young every time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, somebody's wondering, what is the secret of your looking youthfully? Grace at work. Because grace does not sweat. How did David kill Goliath? Say with me, grace. And a 17-year-old boy will kill a, you know, a giant with a little stone. Goliath didn't stagger. He fell down. That shouldn't be a giant falling down. Grace at work. Divine enabling. Please don't compete with a man or a woman of grace. There are many of you seated here. Grace will build your miracle house. That is... You will be building and be smiling. 
I've been wondering, where, where are they making it from? Now, something about grace is that it is indescribable. Because you don't know the source. You don't know the root. You can't. That's what makes the difference. You will never find me anywhere with a frown face. Except when, when dealing with the devil. <laughs> Out of a very hungry spirit. Divine enabling. Now, a clear description is made of grace in Zechariah chapter 6, I mean chapter 4 rather, Zechariah chapter 4 uh, from verses 1 to 10. Now from verse 1, there is a description of a golden candlestick. All of gold. All of gold. But it was standing with inability to function. Simply because there was no oil on that candlestick. The glory of the candlestick is the oil. Without oil, the candlestick is reduced to mere household decoration. Like many of you have decorations around your house. And then in the vision, the prophet asked, Lord, what meant this? And he said, this is what it means. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Say the Lord of hosts. And in verse 7, he began to explain what that spirit is. He talks about grace there. He said, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with crying, saying, grace, grace, grace. He shall bring forth the headstone. He shall bring forth the glory. He shall bring forth the gable of the building. Now, if you are familiar with uh, the building construction, it is not how much you spend on a building that brings out its beauty. It is the finishing. Am I right? So you can build a very simple house and make it most colorful in that community. How? By the finishing touches. So grace is the finishing touch. Is the finishing. It, that is why I said grace covers your error and colors your effort. The essence of finishing on a building is to cover some errors of construction. Women will like this. Grace is your divine makeup. Amen. You know what I mean? Grace is your divine makeup. What makes for beauty for a woman, for instance, is not the expense of the cloth, but the color combination, the makeups, the choice of the bag and the shoes and the skirt and the blouse and the head tie or the hat, the painting of the face. Amen. <laughs> That's what grace does. That's why before I leave home every morning, I wear grace. Amen. <laughs> I do my makeup before I leave home under the grace of God. So when you see me, it's not the actual me you see, it's the grace you see. You're going to look for a job, you're going for an interview. After carrying your file, your documents, we are grace. When they see you, you are the one we are looking for. Before asking you for your papers, you are the one we are looking for. That's what happened to David. The first day he appeared at the palace of Saul, the king loved him. He, he, he practically imposed himself on Saul. No training, no trial, no interview. Immediately he became the ammo bearer. Where do you do that? No discussion of any time. Immediately he sent to Jesse his father. He said, this your son David is with me. I will not let him leave this place. Let him go and bring his load. I love him. He has found favor in my sight.
The subject should be applying to the palace. But now the palace is applying to the subject. That will be your story. Very shortly, they'll be calling you up to come and occupy places you don't qualify for. So, grace is for the unable, the disabled, the inadequate, the insufficient, the inefficient, people like me. Amen. <laughs> if you want grace to be at work in your life, don't boast on anything you have. Did you hear Paul the Apostle? I am what I am by the grace of God. Before you tell people who you are and what you have, tell them about the grace of God upon your life. Number two definition of grace is simply put, the fullness of God. Grace is the fullness of God. That is the only way I can describe grace. Because it goes beyond any human ability. It goes beyond any measurement and parameter. The grace of God, I mean, grace simply means God at work in man. God at work in man. If you read from John chapter 1, talking about the word of God, verse 12, as many as received him to them, gave you power to become. Verse 14, and the word became flesh. And he dwelt amongst us. And then in verse 16, he began to talk about the grace of God. And of his fullness, of the fullness of the word that became flesh, have all we received grace for grace. The fullness of God. Colossians chapter 2 from verse 8 to verse 10. The fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in Christ and in him we are complete. Take it down the line. For him in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we are complete in him. So grace simply means the fullness of God at work in human vessel. For we have this treasure in heart and vessel that the excellency of power may be of God and not of man. Second uh, you know, uh, Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6, 7. Excellency of power may be of God. All I'm here to do this evening by the help of God is to release that grace upon your life. Yeah. Will somebody receive it with a loud amen? Yeah. Now, let's move on quickly. How do you qualify for the grace of God? Of course, number one, salvation. Salvation. If you are not born again, you are not entitled to this grace. The grace of God has appeared unto all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. By grace are ye saved through faith. But next to our salvation very vital is our meekness. Meekness. The meeker you are, the more gracious you become. James chapter 4 verse 6, he giveth grace to the humble. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, emphasizing the same thing. God resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Meekness is key to greatness. What does it mean to be meek? Simply put, it means to admit your weakness. That's one thing many people don't like. Most people want to exhibit their strength instead of admitting their weakness. Admittance of your inadequacy 
of your insufficiency, of your inefficiency, of your inability. Now, if you look at most great men simply occupy the position of inadequacy. Think of Moses, for instance. When the Lord said to Moses, I'm sending you, Moses said, I am not able. Initially, he said he was able. He wanted to start a revolution. And the first day of his outing was the last day of his outing. <laughs> Why? God resisted the proud, not the devil. If you are proud, Satan is not the one that will be sent to you. It's God himself that will send himself to you. God resisted the proud, but give grace to the humble. One who admits that he cannot do it. When the Lord spoke to David, David said, who am I and who is my father's house? That you should show me this great kindness. Meek people don't exhibit what they have. They simply admit their weaknesses before God. Who now enables them to do beyond what they could do. If what you are doing is not a surprise to people and to yourself, then you are not under grace. If your experience is not a surprise to you, you are not under grace. When you are under grace, you become a surprise to yourself. You will be querying yourself, am I the one doing this thing? Some years back, a medical doctor came looking for me. What was it? According to him, he read one of my books and he was blessed. He had eye problem and he was healed. So he came to church at the front desk asking after me that he wanted to see me. And while he was talking to the you know, front desk officer, I came out of the lift in our office. And he was told, that's the man. And when I came close to him, he looked at me from my head to my toe. And he asked me, very strange question, are you the one? <laughs> and I smiled and I said, yes, I'm the one. And he asked me for that more. Are you sure? <laughs> so I left him. <laughs> if he's not sure, I'm sure of myself. <laughs> Save me surprise. That is how your life will be from now. Yeah. You will be securing surprise jobs. Yeah. You will be living in surprise houses. Yeah. You will be elevated to surprise places. Yeah. As a result of your fasting and prayer, I see you elevated to an uncommon level. Amen. Somebody who believes, say loud, amen. amen. Meekness, in the light of this, also means to be level-headed. To be what? Level-headed. What you are saying does not enter your head. To be level-headed. Somebody has seen some 50 million and his head has become bigger than his neck. Somebody is having 10 people working for him and then he's not reachable again. Somebody has three cars and then nobody can talk to him again. And God is watching. As he will soon become the next Nebuchadnezzar. Who will go on sabbatical? And God will not need to do replacement for him. Did you observe that things were working in his absence? God didn't put another king in his place. To show to him that without you I can operate this kingdom. Do you know there is nothing you are doing now that God cannot do without you? Nothing. Nothing. So be level-headed. Be level-headed. There are people who can't serve in church because of their position. Nebuchadnezzar was sent to, 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 to on sabbatical. God sent him on sabbatical to the bush. In no time, he became like a crawler, a crawling animal. When he came back, he said, now I know 
that there is God somewhere. May you receive grace for level-headedness. You know why? Without a slope, there cannot be a flow. Water flows down the line. So your head has to be reachable by the hand of God. There are many people, the hand of God can't reach their head again. What do you do with a child who will not let you put your hand as a father on his head? You leave me alone. When the head of a child becomes the hand of the father, he leaves him alone. When your head becomes bigger than the hand of God, he leaves you alone. Be level-headed. What is meekness? Be correctable. Be instructable. Can God correct you? Can God instruct you? Greatness is reserved for meekness. The meekest is the greatest. Moses was the meekest. Numbers 12, 3, and he became the greatest. Exodus eleven three. 3. The meekest is the richest. For blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the heart. Matthew 5, 5. There are people that God can't put resources in their hands because uh, it will blow them out. He gauges them before he gives more to them. Because here he has seen some 20 million and he's missing church. And God said, if we give him one more million beyond the 20, uh, he won't know the way to the house of God again. So they cut it down to 16. And then he will pray and pray and pray again, oh Lord, why is this reducing? And God said, okay, let's check him. Put 500,000 on top of it. <laughs> That's why people who control kingdom wealth are usually make people. You can't see it around them. You can't see them carry them, say, pompous, carry them, you know. Uh, may you receive grace for it. The meekest is the deepest in Revelation. For the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach in the ways that you should go. Psalm 25 verse 9. Moses the meekest became Moses the deepest. God spoke to him mouth to mouth and face to face. He gave him the ten commandments with his handwritten because of his meekness. And of course the meekest is the highest. Philippians chapter 2 from verses 5 to 10. We saw how that Jesus humbled himself and God made him the highest. He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. He counted himself as non-entity. He made himself of no reputation. And God exalted him. And gave him a name above all names. Now, as I begin to round up. How do you assess more grace? There are two major platforms by which you can increase the grace of God upon your life. Number one is by the word. The word of God. Acts chapter 20 verse 32. I commend you unto God and unto the word of his grace which is able to build you up and deliver to you your inheritance among them which are sanctified. God's word is God's channel for releasing his grace. So the more you hear the word, the more in grace you become. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 2 Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So a word based church is an engraced church. A word craving believer is an engraced believer. Grace multiplies with knowledge. Grace and I mean the word of God enlightens you into the realm of grace. And of course, number two, which many people detest, is prayer and fasting, which is what you are doing right now. Prayer and fasting. It will give you access to unlimited dimension of grace. Unlimited dimension of of grace. While Moses was in prayer, Exodus chapter 33, 
verses 12 and 13, he was focusing on the grace of God. Now, you see, the greatest, or if I may put it this way, the summary of the blessing of prayer and fasting is engracement. 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 When you are defeated, go into prayer. You will never come out of prayer the same way you go into prayer. Let us therefore come boldly. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Unto the throne of grace. Prayer as a practice is described as the throne of grace. Every time you appear at the prayer altar. You are practically appearing at the throne of grace. And I'll show you how it works. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in what time? In the time of need. And all of us have times of need. Let the needy be introduced to the prayer altar and his need will be turned into abundance. Needs practically vanishes in the face of prayer. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, from verse 23, after they were being threatened, verses 21, 22, they were threatened. They warned them not to speak again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 23, they went to their company to report the matter in prayer. And in verse 29, they prayed. And the Holy Ghost came down. And the place where they prayed shook. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And in verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them. This is one thing you must not miss. In case you have been praying for money during this prayer and fasting, it's all right, but you are praying for less. If you are praying for who to marry, it's all right, but you are praying for less. The number one thing to seek in prayer is grace. 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 And great grace was upon them. Great grace was upon them. When you carry grace, you become an attraction. When you carry grace, beauty will show. When you carry grace, everything will work. Because it is the only sufficient thing. With great power, they preach. And great grace was upon them. Great grace was upon them. The ultimate in the prayer school is great grace. Great grace. And especially when it is coupled with fasting, you are taken to a height where it is not you any longer operating. You are overtaken by what cannot be described. That is what Esther did. There was a pending danger on the entire you know, nation of Jews. And ordinarily, Esther was not supposed to appear before the king but after she fasted, everything turned in her favor. Everything turned in her favor. From this season, everything will turn in your favor. I say everything will turn in your favor. Everything will turn in your favor. Through this prayer and fasting, you will find mercy. You will find grace. Now, listen to this. Do you know that even Jesus our Lord, could not step into the fullness of the grace of God upon his life until he went into prayer and fasting. Any doctrine that tells you that prayer and fasting is not necessary will only leave you on the floor. There is no software that can take the place of fasting. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> this thing called fasting is what every believer must engage in. Jesus said, when ye fast, not if you fast. 
Today we are replacing this demand with technology. As a pastor, your grammar can be very sweet. If you are not empowered, demons will mess you up. You will sleep and be having all kinds of dreams. <laughs> you need the raw power of God that comes via prayer and fasting. In Luke chapter 4, before then, Jesus was simply being called son of Joseph. He was meant to be declared as son of God. But because the power that would turn him into son of God had not manifested, they were calling him the son of Joseph. I don't know what name they are calling you now. I don't know what surname they are calling you. But there is a bigger surname waiting for you. You have to walk your way to it. You have to walk your way to it. The demons won't let you go. You have to walk your way to it. Jesus couldn't assess it. The best he had was the award of the best carpenter. They were calling him Jesus the carpenter. Jesus the Savior was reduced to Jesus the carpenter. The whole world was waiting for him. He was limited to his word. He was limited to W-A-R-D. When W-O-R-L-D was waiting for him. And I guess Jesus just woke up one day. And in chapter 4, he went to the wilderness to pray. And in verse 14, he returned in the power of the spirit. And his fame spread dead abroad. After fasting, limitations are destroyed. Do you know that after this fasting, many of you will find yourself in a different world altogether. This church will move to a new realm completely. <laughs> a church that does not observe prayer and fasting will remain limited, will remain enclosed, will remain pocketed by the devil. We're talking about how to assess the in rawness, the fullness of God's plan for your life. One day, Jesus was menacing somewhere. And his disciples had gone ahead of him. You find this story in Matthew chapter 17. And they got to a place where they met a little child that was demon possessed. They shook the child. The demon refused to come out. They spoke grammar. The demon refused to come out. And Jesus met them there in the acrobatic display. I guess this Peter, out of anger, slapped the demon-possessed fellow. <laughs> demon said, I won't come out. And as Jesus was coming, the demon saw him coming. He saw him coming. He never spoke one word. He saw him coming. And in a bit to come out, threw up the young boy, landed him on the floor and came out. He couldn't wait for Jesus to come because a higher power was coming. And then out of curiosity, they asked, Master, why could we not cast out the devils? And Jesus said, is that how to cast out the devil? I was on the mountain praying you were sleeping. I was fasting you are eating. Is that how to cast out devils? He said, first of all, you need faith. You need faith. But secondly, this particular kind will not go except by prayer and fasting. Listen to this. Faith will move mountain, but prayer and fasting will move all obstacles. Every obstacle, every kind. Faith will do some kind, but fasting will command every kind, every kind, every kind. If you want to deal with every kind of situation, the answer is there. Go into fasting. Go into fasting. Go into fasting. There are, Jesus made it very clear. There are certain devils that will not go except by the engagement of prayer and fasting. There are some grounds that will never be broken except by prayer and fasting. There are certain realms of business you cannot enter into except by prayer and fasting. Especially if you will not bribe people. You know, in the system of the world, because some people may be thinking about some people in the world who don't fast, they make their way through. You need to find out what they do. The bribe they give, the demons they consult. Except you want to go their way. If you want to go the way of the Lord, 
you need to engage to a level where Satan cannot compete with you. Where people who hate you at your appearance, they just like you. Amen. <laughs> Everywhere I go to, people don't, they like me. Everywhere I appear, including those who say they don't like me. When I, somebody comes to tell me that somebody says he doesn't like you, I say, let's go there. By the time we get there, you are welcome, sir. You are welcome, sir. You are welcome, sir. Because you, what I'm carrying, you stand on the way, it will cross you. Crush you. But you don't get to that realm except by prayer and fasting. Except by prayer and fasting. That's what Jesus said. This kind get not except by prayer and fasting. If pastors are here, there is no method you can use for church to grow without prayer and fasting. I've been in this thing a few years. Next year, I will make it 30 years I've been pastoring. This thing does not happen. That's some of you, you are doing business. It's like you are almost hitting the thing and it's, it's refusing. Tell the business, wait, I'm coming. Wait. And go for three days, as the case may be. Or go for seven days, as the Lord leads you. And go and rock it out. Before you come out of that room, all the demons, demons on the way will have cleared off. Don't joke with this thing. What we are doing, these 40 days that will be concluded next few days, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. There are people who do regular fasting. There are people who live fasted life. That's what I do most of the time. Because I need to be on top every time. Just like you gauge, you put fuel in your, in your, in your vehicle all of the time. So that the vehicle can be ready to move all the time. The way many, many believers eat. It makes, the, it makes Satan happy. It makes him very happy. Because when you eat physically, you become light spiritually. Fasting actually means fasting your belt. Fasting makes you fast in the journey of life. Find out from Elijah. Elijah, a man of prayer and fasting. He took off from the same spot with Ahab and the best horses and overtook him 22 miles of the journey. An old man given to spirituality overtook a young man on horses and chariots. If you want speed, well, you have seen it already. I'm sure our pastor must have taught us a lot of things on prayer and fasting, but we are practically engaging it. Please don't do this thing halfway. Don't. Don't. Don't put snack here and put granite here. And say, well, you know, it's just that I'm not eating real food. You know, God knows my strength. <laughs> you will meet him at the other side. <laughs> You will meet him at the other side. You can't be using metal to, you know, do something somewhere and then expect that God will have answered you. Whatever a man sows, that's what he shall reap. If you sow to spiritual things, you will reap everlasting things. This thing will first of all make you lean before it will get you fat. It will turn your eyes when you are fasting. But after that, your eyes will become clear. My eyes have been turned several times, but now I can see clearer. That's why Peter couldn't see vision until he was hungry. You'll find that story in Acts of Apostles chapter 10. He was hungry, then he entered into a, fran into a trance. There are certain spiritual things you cannot assess except by your fasting. Even revelation from God's word, you can assess it except by fasting. We don't have all the time, but you can read from Isaiah chapter 58. He said, after your fasting, then shall your life break forth out of obscurity. Revelation upon revelation. You know why Paul was a man of revelation? He was a man given to fast. He said in fastings often. In fastings often. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter, verse 27. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. And then chapter 12, verse 7. God gave him abundance of revelation. Well, we are closing right now. You are receiving grace. Rise to your feet. You are receiving grace. You are receiving grace. You are receiving grace. You are receiving grace. Quickly before I begin to pray, I want to ask tonight, I believe I'm talking to very sincere people. 
I believe there is no hypocrite here tonight. An hypocrite is one who pretends to be who he is not. I believe tonight there is nobody who is pretending to be who he is not. I believe tonight all of us will be naked before the Lord. Very sincerely. I believe you allow your conscience to speak to you right now. Wherever you are this evening, you know you are not born again. You know you have not given your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want you to be very open. God shows mercy to all. God does not condemn people. Don't assume that you are in Christ when you are not. God does not condemn people. And I don't have the power to do so. But I want you to be open tonight. You know you are not born again. You know you have not given your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the first step to take to assess the grace of God. Somebody is saying, Pastor, please pray for me. I know I'm not born again. You look far from God. I'm not saying this to condemn you. But I want to paint a picture of yourself before the Lord. You know there is a gap between you and God. And you want to come close to Him. Or maybe you gave your life to Jesus before but you backslid it. And you want to return like the prodigal son. And you're saying, Pastor, please pray for me. I need the mercy of God. Please pray for me. If your heart is telling you something like that, will you please let me pray for you tonight? Forget about who is next to you. Will you please lift up your right hand? If you're in that condition, you want to be born again, you want Jesus in your life, you want to surrender your life to him, or you want to be restored back to the faith, God bless you. I can see some hands up there. If you are raising your hand, raise it properly above your head. Don't be ashamed. God bless you out there. God bless you, young man. God bless you. God bless you. I know more people. God is talking to you right now. Don't harden your heart. Open up your heart to him. You, there is nothing you will gain hardening your heart. Don't harden your heart. Maybe you are here. You are full of religion. Just like I was. As a young boy, I was full of religion. I was even in the choir, but I was not born again. Until that day, I gave my life to Jesus. And I got peace. I got joy. If you are not having that joy, if you are not having that peace, it's an indication that Jesus is not there. So quickly, if you are joining us, raise your hand. You want to be born again? Now, can I request all of you who have raised your hand, take a step right now. Come meet me here and let's pray together. Meet me at the altar here right now and let's pray together. You want Jesus in your life? God bless you for your sincerity. Help me put your hands together for Jesus as they come. Come quickly. You want Jesus in your life? You want to be born again? You want new life? It will do you good. You will never regret it. God bless you, young man. You are starting your journey very great. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come quickly if you are coming. Come quickly. God bless you. I was under 16 years old when I gave my life to Jesus. As a little schoolboy, about to graduate from school, I gave my life to Jesus. And since then, next year, we'll make it. Some 40 years when I did that, I have no regret for it. I have no regret for it. Jesus is making life sweeter by the day. I perceive there are two more people before I pray who are still hanging out there. You want to come? Something is telling you not to come. Tell that devil to leave you alone. Take that step quickly. Come out here right now. Allow me to pray for you. You know yourself. Don't keep hanging there when you should be here. One more person. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. Quickly come. God bless you. Now all of you in front here, lift up your right hand. And if you are coming to join us, do that right now. As you keep your heads bowed before the Lord, pray this prayer with me and do it out loud. Say with me, Lord Jesus. Make it louder if you can. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you tonight. I know I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Wash my sins away. Make me your child from today. I forsake my sins. I surrender to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I am now a child of God. I am now born again. Jesus, give me your power to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that these souls be saved and be saved eternally in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Please open your eyes. Will you please, uh, which way? Look at the officials out here and please go with them church give jesus a big hand hallelujah amen now i'd like you to lift up your hand before the lord i pray for you at two levels 
One, you receive the grace from God, and then I'll be releasing upon you the grace of God that I carry to this place tonight. So, like Paul will say, you can become partakers of my grace. First of all, lift up your eyes before the Lord. And I'd like you to speak to him, especially those of you who can pray in the Holy Ghost. I want you to pray to him in the language of the Spirit. Speak and forget about yourself. If you can, make it strong. Make it loud. Just look up to heaven as one who needs help. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. My help will come from the Lord. Call for great grace. Call for great grace. Father, like you did for the apostles, let great grace, great grace come upon me tonight. Somebody pray in the Holy Ghost if you can. And if you need to, pray in your human language as well. Talk to him right now. Speak to him. He's hearing you right now. Borom bluk tik lok to skidi bron de klak to jeklak la bron de blon to si di elosa. Si se se za. Branda prende prendo prende klek lo tu si za. Iton du skiteo a. Entulo skin trom broni katak te giga giga glak te dio shagla bara. Hu ha ha. Hu. Ton si kle prende prun di branda brak to dea. Esi toe bogua. Esi toe bogua. Esi ram prende krom brun di prende klik tu tu si glak klek lo bla ha ha. Hu. Ni soki branak te dio shaga pa bodia pa bodia pa bodia pa bodia eti de de sikle eti de sikle eti de klekli di di zozo a brand clock to je ikegege to shaka babaraya somebody receive the grace of God right now receive divine enabling receive the fullness of God receive the fullness of God receive the fullness of God assess the fullness of God and time to the fullness of God and time to the fullness of God assess the fullness of God moro bokiato satayada Moshike kele glagra na klendo si de brondi blom 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 bosha e buba boa e buba boa e tenesi se se real akabanda assess the grace of God receive the grace of God assess the grace of God receive the abundance of the grace of God oh tini ando sosoa oh tini ando sosoa grace for new level grace for next level grace for change of position. Grace for favor. Receive it right now. 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 Ma! Tobrele kotueke kekala branda batua baba. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name, we are prayed. So shall it be. In Jesus' glorious name. Now, stretch your hands here if you can, please. I'm standing here tonight by the enlistment of grace. I'm standing before you as an embodiment of the grace of God. Everywhere I'm privileged to step to, people can read the grace of God upon my life. And what I have, I give unto you. Yeah. What I have, I breathe upon you. Yeah. Because I don't struggle, you will never see struggles again in your life. Yeah. Because nobody notices my sweat. Yet, they cannot deny my effect. From this day, see no more sweater. I don't make noise. Yet, by his election, the news are everywhere. From this day, you will not make noise to make news again. This church will never see struggles or crawling again. From this moment, everything you lay your hands to do will be described as the grace of God at work. I am here tonight as God sent me by the cooperation of his servant to ask me to be here. As I stand before you, 
all are brought to you the fullness of the blessing of the gospel the fullness the fullness my father I totally release everything you have sent me to bring here tonight without reservation I release it so everyone here receive it in the name of Jesus From tonight, grace will be speaking in your life. Grace will be speaking in your life. Grace will be speaking in your life. In the precious name of Jesus. Everyone under the sound of my voice, you will begin to replicate grace. I decree duplication of grace upon your life. Of Jesus, Amen. the way it is working in my hand, it will begin to work in your hand. Amen. So shall it be. Amen. Wave your hand and give glory to Jesus. Can I ask Pastor Sam to please come? Raise your hand and give glory to Jesus. Give glory to Jesus. Give glory to Jesus. Give glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. In Jesus' precious name. Now, please stretch your hands here. And let's ask for fresh grace upon our pastor here. Fresh grace. Just call it fresh grace. Fresh grace. Stretch your hands here. Fresh grace. Because when it comes on him, it will, it will come to you. When it comes on him, it will come to you. If you pray deeply for him, you will receive measure beyond your measure. You will receive measure beyond your widest imagination. Now receive the grace. Before this witness, before this holy house, receive the grace, the grace, the grace, sweat free, struggle free, stress free. Nobody will see your sweat again. Nobody will see your struggle again. Nobody will notice your sweat and your struggle and your stress again. Stress free, struggle free, sweat free. That is your new dimension. That is your new realm. The things that people are looking for will be coming to you. They'll be coming to you. They'll be coming to you. In the name of Jesus, so shall it be. I don't go around, yet things come to meet me where I am. From today, you will not go around before blessing comes to you. The things that others are going around to look for, will begin to look for you. The ministry of Jesus spreaded with fame. At the instance of the grace that came upon him, I decree new dimension of fame upon this church, upon this ministry, in the name of Jesus. So shall it be in Jesus' precious name. And all of you who have received it, the same flow of grace, the same flow of blessing, the same flow, dimension of success, of breakthroughs the same dimension of spiritual breakthroughs upon your lives receive it now in the name of Jesus wave your hand one more time and give glory to God 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 thank you Jesus